Hey everyone, and welcome to Legend Makers. This is a special interview. Sh you know, I fudged that. Let's try it again. <laughs> <clears throat> hey everyone, welcome to Legend Makers. This is a special interview for our convention, Legend Haven. Today we're joined by Karina Fabian. Welcome, Karina. How are you? Hey, I am doing fine. Thank you. Karina's talk today is on uh, faith in fiction. Uh, you know, maybe incorporating our faith into sci-fi or fantasy. How to do that? She writes science fiction and fantasy, uh, often humorous, but always clever. Her most Catholic series uh, involve space-fearing nuns and a Catholic dragon detective with a nun for a partner, because why not? Karina, this is mm -hmm. going to be fun. Let's take it away. We're talking faith in fiction. Uh, why is this a, a topic that matters to you? Okay. Um, well, I think it's a topic that matters to all writers who feel very strongly about their faith, particularly Catholics, um, because we we take it seriously. Um, and we're also very aware of how our actions can influence others, um, whether it's what we're writing or what we're saying or how we're living. And so there is a, um, I don't want to say a pressure, but there's a feeling of, of kind of obligation that whatever we are writing, that it should stay at least true to our faith and our beliefs. And um, if not overtly Catholic or strongly Christian. Mm -hmm. So um, there are well, ways to do that, though, without it becoming a sermon. Awesome. So l let me ask you about your what's your origin story? Uh, and then share with us a little bit more about the novels that you've written, because this has been your way to directly kind of wrestle and have fun with the elements of faith-inspired mm -hmm. fiction. So what is your origin story? And share with us uh, the, the novels we've mentioned. Okay, so the first thing um, that I published was actually a um, anthology of Christian science fiction. And it really started on a date. Uh, my husband and I we had two kids at the time. I was just starting to write for uh, the diocese newspaper. My husband is uh, it was in Space Command at the time and also very active in Artemis Society. So we went on a date and we're talk tossing ideas back and forth for a story. And we came up with this idea of a near future uh, universe where we are colonizing the solar system and the church is out there and doing mm -hmm. things. And so we came up with the Rescue Sisters, who essentially is an order of religious that do search and rescue operations in outer space. And that led us to writing some short stories, which became an anthology. That The first one was Christian by request of our publisher. The next mm -hmm. two were Catholic. And from there, um, I started writing some fantasy and I was writing a noir detective story with a dragon. And every noir detective has to have a reason to feel bitter about his life. <laughs> and what would make a dragon feel more bitter than a bad run-in with St. George? And mm -hmm. that's how that happened. And of course, since it was St. George, the whole church got dragged in and then he needed a partner. So I brought in Sister Grace because Vern needed more grace in his life. And it's just been a lot of fun ever since. <laughs> So how do you, so, I mean, it, the first question then is, can you portray faith in science fiction, especially sci-fi? Uh, when you do it, are you creating something weird or is it something that has a healthy home in it? What would you say? I believe it has a healthy home. Um, I think that we've been discouraged against the idea because during the Enlightenment, there was this feeling that science was separated from um, religion, when in fact that has never been true right up until the time of the Enlightenment. I mean, even the ancient Greeks, the Pythagoreans, they weren't just coming up with great math. They were trying to figure out the workings of the gods. Mm -hmm. And now if you talk to scientists in this day and age, yeah, you're going to find some that are atheists, but you're going to find a great many who either were already religious and the Catholic church still to this day does a lot of support of the sciences, but also others who found faith, who realized there is a God 
because of their scientific studies. As they delve deeper and deeper, they said there, there's there's something here. There's something more. And that brought them to it. So you cannot separate faith and religion and science. And so I think it's unrealistic to portray a, a, a godless future. I would say also that some of the best stories, either out of the last century, like some of the heavyweights that, that you'll probably share with us in a second, people that we've you know grown to love, but even some of the stories that are uh, super popular today, either in sci-fi or fantasy, they're all wrestling or they have stood the test of time because they wrestle with, if not faith in an overt way, the ideas inherent in faith or the practices and the liturgy of what faith does to daily life. They wrestle with that in a very real way. And it just feels so obvious and beautiful and desirable that we just keep rewatching these movies and we just want them remade over and over again. I think that the, there's a truth to that as opposed to all the others that are like, oh, we're just going to be deconstructivist materials, whatever. It's like, okay, we watched that popcorn. Okay, never again. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I mean, some of the classics of science fiction from Canticle for Leibowitz to um, some stories by James Blish deal with religious themes um, mm -hmm. and the Canticle for Leibowitz overtly Catholic uh, mm -hmm. has to do with a, a religious order mm -hmm. um, in modern times and some of the lesser knowns, but great friends of mine, I have to mention them, Colleen Drapet's Star Brothers. These are evangelists out. It's at space opera. So they are way out far in the future, very deep space. Mm -hmm. um, Corinna's I Am Margaret is a dystopia that she actually started um, inspired by um, Hunt Hunger Games. Okay. And then, of course, my own rescue sisters. But then let's talk about, you're talking about the movies and the shows that you see over and over again. Um, mm -hmm. Star Trek had faith. And sometimes people were actually surprised in that because Gene Roddenberry was an atheist. But mm -hmm. he understood that human nature has to have mm. that expression. And Deep Space Nine as a series was um, very, very overt about mm -hmm. faith themes through the Bajoran religion. Um, mm -hmm. and, you, uh, and you saw both the beautiful and the, the, the difficult in it. And they, they didn't shy away from the big ideas. And that's another reason why bringing faith into your fiction Mm -hmm. is a desirable thing because it can inform your world. It can mm -hmm. help your characters develop their moral standing. And not just because, oh, I, I need this guy to be a good guy, but because he can have a very deep understanding about why this person is a good guy or why there is good and evil. I mean, that is that is a religious um Articulation. I, yeah. yeah, the good and evil is something that exists, mm -hmm. and sometimes you'll find, you know, when you when you get into the agnostic and the atheist, there's all the shades of gray, and we all love to explore those shades of gray. But when you bring in a faith based grounding, mm -hmm. you can still explore those yeah. shades but with the idea that, yes, there is an absolute evil and there is an absolute good and we should be gravitating toward the good. And as a people, as, as a species, we want that. Mm -hmm. Whether we want to admit it, whether we want to rebel against the idea, we still have a deep reaction mm -hmm. to this idea that you can find a real good. You mm -hmm. can know a real evil and you should defeat the real evil. Right. I remember there's a, a little moment I was playing, I think it was like Halo 2 or 3, and there's a moment where he's on this massive walker that's going across some landscape we were discovering. And all of a sudden it just struck me, oh my goodness, within this story, there is no transcendent. There is nothing. There's just matter fighting matter. And all of a sudden it felt like this oppressive cage cell creation becomes this black cage cell and we're never getting out uh, because there is nothing else and like what you're saying when you do bring in your faith when you when you're even if you're dramatizing it or, or you're metaphoring it, and i want to ask you that about that in a second does it have to be overt 
Can you be creative with it? What instantly happens is you are providing a sense of story and orientation for the human person. You're reintroducing incredibly dynamic concepts, like you said, good and evil. Like you take those away, you remove any, like Peterson says, like a map of meaning on, on reality. Ooh, you take yeah. that away, all of a sudden you're left with, what do I do? I don't even know why I'm here. I could, I could make up my own reasons, but if we want to come together as a community, well, we all need to be looking at the same map together. And that's what faith then brings to a story and then maybe even a relationship between the writer and, and the reader. Yeah. Um, it's interesting that, that you brought up Halo because they've made a series about Halo. Did you know that? I did. I've seen it. Most yeah. Of it. Okay. Well, and then, then you know they had to introduce something beyond that was just was more than you know let's go out and kill all the aliens they had to bring in this story yeah. that had in it some very mm -hmm. deep moral conundrums mm -hmm. and and an idea of you know where is my identity they even brought in a religion mm -hmm. a, a made up one with the aliens that mm -hmm. then they abducted a a human and kind of they felt like she was a chosen one and yeah, brought exactly. her into Prophet. that too. Mm -hmm. But there's that whole idea of rights and wrongs, um, mm -hmm. of goods and evils. And, and even she was able to see that this, this faith that, that she got brought up in because she'd been kidnapped mm -hmm. by the aliens, in the end she realized, and I hope this isn't a spoiler for anybody who hasn't seen it, she realized that what she was doing was wrong. Mm -hmm. You can't do that unless you have a grounding in a faith, in a belief of good and evil. Right. So do, do you have to write uh, your religion? Can How creative can you get when it comes to that? As Catholic Orthodox or as Christians, are there any guardrails? Um, oh, that's a good one. I would say... Yes, because at some point, um, if you get too far off the beaten path, um, I would say if you create a religion where what you know is wrong, looks way too realistic and way too attractive, and you never bring the consequences of, of accepting that attractiveness, then yeah, you've gone off the rails. Um, and I, I don't think that that happens with someone who has a good grounding in their faith because we bring ourselves into our books, whether we believe or intend to or not, that simply comes out. That's where that write what you know comes from. It doesn't mean that you have to factually know every single thing, but the things that you understand in your heart are going to come out in your writing because right. those are the things you know. Mm -hmm. um, so how far can you go? And how much makeup can you do of your faith? really depends on a couple of things. One, what your story needs. Hold up my hands. One, what your story needs. Two, who your audience is. Mm -hmm. And three, what you're trying to accomplish. Right. So if you are writing, say, specifically for a Catholic or Christian audience, and you know those are the people that are going to be reading your books, you can be far more overt. That's mm -hmm. like my rescue sister stories. Mm -hmm. It is very much a Catholic story. They yeah. have, they pray, they say the rosary. I have one nun, oh, I love her to pieces. She only talks in scripture, saint quotes, and tech manuals. That's about the only way that she can communicate. <laughs> that yeah. she, She's kind of Asperger's, I guess, in that way. Okay. Um, and I have had some non um, Christian readers or non Catholic readers who have said it sounds a little bit preachy, but that's because this is my audience. I'm talking to Catholics. Right. And so they have a, a different understanding. Mm -hmm. um, but even when you are working toward a secular audience, there can still be actual religious elements. I mean, the and, Catholic yeah. faith is probably the most portrayed faith in science fiction, in fiction in general. And it's mm -hmm. because it's so easily recognizable. Mm -hmm. If you describe a cathedral, you don't have to say this is a Catholic cathedral. You only have to talk about the stained glass and the crucifix and everybody knows, oh, we're talking about, um, we're talking about religion at right. this point. We're talking about Christianity. 
You can say priest and everybody immediately knows this is what kind of person he's going to be. These are the things he's going to talk about. These are the things he's going to believe. And whether or not you stay true to that stereotype informs your story. Mm -hmm. um, so this will lead me to my next question then, which is, you know, um, like when to not include faith in story. Cause like, like following up from what you're saying, like I haven't seen this movie, but I've seen about it. And maybe some of us have too called um, silence, for example, uh, by Martin Scorsese. And it's about a couple of Jesuits in, in Japan. And I don't know how many, Thousands and thousands of people saw it and were, were moved by it, were challenged by it, angered, dis, you know, discussing it and so on. But the key thing was, while they were Catholic, the story was more about what is the human response, even if it's a wrong one, to these situations. And it mm -hmm. doesn't, you know, it's more of a point of what is a believable human interaction with things that they hold to be true, and then where do they fall? And what does that mean about, you know, and then that is something that no matter what religion you're in or what faith you follow, that is something we can all relate to because uh, you could transpose that same kind of story into a Buddhist context or into Orthodox context exactly. or whatever, so but we would then, still connect with it. Yeah. So then the answer to the question is when don't I include religion mm -hmm. is when it doesn't inform your story. You should never, in my opinion, force faith into a story. It should be organic to what you're writing. Um, now, I'm a very character-based writer. So, mm -hmm. for example, I would never try to make one of my characters follow a religion, no matter what religion I'm thinking of, um, mm -hmm. even it's something that I've made up for the, for the sake of the story. Because if it's not true to who the character is, it will read false. And if it reads mm -hmm. false, it can come off as preaching. And then the readers so switch the off. second the second yeah. thing is don't don't write a story and I'm gonna I'm gonna qualify this because it depends on audience and it depends if you're purposely doing a morality tale don't listen to what I'm saying but if you are <laughs> writing a story that is intended to entertain mm -hmm. then don't go in saying well I want to teach this mm -hmm. Let that right. theme come out, massage it later. But if you're having to get out of your story, get out of your character's head in order to teach your audience something, teach your reader something, then mm -hmm. you have crossed from good fiction mm -hmm. into the preachy fiction. And that's what people rebel yeah. against. And you're not going to accomplish what right. you were hoping. If it comes out through the story, Mm -hmm. your theme, your morality, the tale mm -hmm. you want to tell, then then you're doing it right. But if right. you have to stop and explain, it's like in science fiction, they have the, as you know, Bob, and then he has to go through this whole long scientific diatribe thing, and everybody's like, mm -hmm. oh, the same thing can happen with religion. Right. If you're spending too much time having to explain, mm -hmm. even if it's one character explaining to another character why something has to be the way it is, then you're not doing it right. And you can yeah. pull back mm -hmm. and just, and I think let it, you got to let it happen. And I like how you said, if, if you are trying to write uh, evangelistic literature, if you're trying to write a veneer of fiction over an apologetics tract, you know, or if you're trying to feel like, ah, I need to put more Catholic, you know, overt Christian Orthodox stuff like into what I'm writing. Um, okay. Just, know that that's what you're doing don't mm -hmm. expect that everybody is going to want to read that as opposed to your primary call well it may be your primary call and if you're at this con it's probably your primary call which is the call to author the call to create fiction the call to get somebody to want to step away from their lives for like two hours and just enter into a story and a drama and and not want to leave and live somebody else's life for a little while and wrestle with their questions through their heart, through their steps. Uh, that is a different kind of thing than like what you're saying, morality plays, which are, it, it's a different thing. Own that, stick that landing. Yeah. And, and I have done both. I actually, my, one of my very first stories was in a Christian magazine and it was basically 
a reaction to somebody who wrote us one of those, oh, as long as I accept Jesus as my personal savior, I'll make it to heaven kind of stories. And I wrote the antithesis story where he kept saying that and kept doing all the awful things and then got rejected. Hmm. Um, but you know, then by the other token, uh, my Dragon Eye series was actually first published by hmm. an atheist. Okay. Even though I had a Catholic dragon, even though I had bishops in it, even though Vern prayed, mm -hmm. because it was so organic and so central and, and sometimes so conflicted because it's mm -hmm. not always easy to follow your faith. And that right. he was very honest about all of that. Um, but one thing I want to also bring up is, it, especially given um, who, who would be listening to this, is that, and I've seen it with friends of mine, that there can be a great pressure that, well, since I'm a Catholic, all my fiction has got to have that Catholicness. I mean, capital C, trademark, yeah. Yeah. screaming Catholic is what I call it. Um, mm -hmm. And that's just not true. As long as you are staying true to our beliefs through the themes and through, you know, the basically the whole tale of your thing. Um, as long as you're not purposely leading someone to sin, like if you were writing erotica, um, then let the story unfold and trust that God is going to bring that faith aspect, that morality aspect, that, that inspirational aspect. Mm -hmm. If you're doing your job right, don't feel like just because you are a Christian or because you are a Catholic, you have to have Christians and Catholics in your stories. Mm -hmm. Oh, in your case, you've got a dragon. <laughs> <with the PI. laughs> so in starting to wrap but up. Again, then, that was not on. because I said, well, I'm a Catholic. I need a Catholic dragon. Right. It was because I needed more dragon why would he be upset? Well, obviously, St. George. Everybody knows St. George and the dragon. I don't mm -hmm. care what faith you are. So why not? And because in my world, the dragons aren't killable, mm -hmm. because then St. George would have killed him. Um, right. I had to do something else with him that made him feel obligated and tied mm -hmm. down. And mm -hmm. that's that's where that came out. Yeah. And you can have, there are some some authors, for example, uh, I think of Chesterton or uh, like Kino Gaia is one I read recently. And those are explicitly about dramatizing and then talking through very deep ideas through very dramatic situations. Um, you're not going to put that up with like, you know, Michael Crichton and Stephen Lawhead or something. It, it's the, the function of the story that you're trying to tell is mm -hmm. and the audience you're writing for and what they want out of this story all of that plays a part of it so taking the time to know what it is you're what is you trying to do and then and then own it don't try to be subversive because we all it's so easy to see and it falls flat it's the job is to be a fiction author not a not a faith sort of preacher so and then in, in wrapping up my last question then is how how do i add faith while making a good story okay well we've, we've kind of covered a little of that already mm -hmm. number one is focus on telling the good story um let your characters be themselves and if faith comes in then bring the faith in um but how was i going with that just don't force it. Don't don't make them go to church mm -hmm. because you want to portray them going to church because they are Catholic. If if your story does not require them to go to church, it happens in the background. Mm -hmm. Just like if you have a married couple, you don't have to show them having relations. You don't even have to mention it. That's a big part of marriage, sure, but that can be in the background, okay? It's mm -hmm. that same kind of thing. It doesn't always have to be in there. Uh, but the other thing, too, is don't use faith like a magic wand mm. or, um, or pun intended, deus ex machina, mm -hmm. where it's the solve all of your problems, um, where Christians are too, are too, they're too Christian to be mean to each mm -hmm. other or to be snarky or to have problems because 
God's there. Have you met any Christians? Happy. Because <laughs> yeah, let's face it, that's not reality. That's yeah. not a human experience, and it's not a reader's experience. Right. So that that's the the idea of the Mary Sue, where the person is so perfect mm -hmm. that they have no problems at all. Um, so don't do that where the person is so Christian that they don't have any problems at all, don't have any moral flaws at all. Everybody is flawed. And as Catholics, we understand that. Mm -hmm. And as Catholics, it's very interesting mm -hmm. to us. Um, let's see. Father, Father Guy Consul Magno um, said that, that the Catholic understanding of a flawed humanity means that we expect characters who can be as loved as they make mistakes and do wrong as when they do right. We understand too that happy endings aren't always the happiest endings. And mm -hmm. so um, I don't know if you've ever had the experience where, where you close the book and it's bittersweet, not just because the story ended, but because you feel like there was something more that can happen. Mm -hmm. that, that the person achieved a, a happy ending, but you just felt like, wow, you know, maybe, maybe there's something else that can go on. And of course, that means there's a sequel <laughs> <laughs> that you want, right? You want them to go, wait, I need more about this character. So, um, and show your, show your characters being conflicted, being involved. And, and when the faith is brought in, don't just make it the, oh, I'm so happy to be in church and Jesus is here and I love him and all of that. You know, you, let them go to church when they're in trouble. Let them go to church and be distracted and thinking about things that further your plot. Let them pray deeply from the heart mm -hmm. uh, and, and not just, not just get comfort because mm -hmm. nobody, uh, it, well, if you do, I, I, God bless you. Um, but like even mother Teresa, one of, one of our, our, our most modern loved saints said that for many, many years, she felt separate of Jesus. She didn't feel the comfort. She right. knew it was there. She kept going. She persevered. But she mm -hmm. didn't have that kind of experience. Um, and so, you know, it's very natural mm -hmm. for even your characters to have that kind of thing. And I think that space right there that you just described is the space where when we're creating heroic characters, for example, that's where they need to live is I don't feel it anymore. And now I'm at a point of choosing. Do I go somewhere else or do I keep trying to act and do the best that I can in spite of the fact that I got nothing anymore? And I think, for example, Daredevil is an awesome. That series from Netflix is great for there's plenty of Catholic elements in there. But anybody and everybody watches that and fell in love with that because they saw a person really wrestling with, yes, these are the things this particular religion says, but how does an actual human work through those things? And everybody can relate to that and then just love who he becomes and see, oh, there's maybe there's something there. There's some, so this wisdom tradition is just beautiful. So Karina, where can people find you online if they want to check out more of your, your work, grab a copy of your books? Where are you online? Okay, well, the easiest one is uh, KarinaFabian.com or FabianSpace.com. And you can find all of my series, both the secular and the religious, uh, just in the book section. Or you can just look up my name on Amazon. Um, I have about 30 books out right now. Mm -hmm. And so everything from um, Star Trek parody to the Rescue Sisters. Sorry, how many books out did you say? 30 or so. I'm losing what? track. <laughs> I don't count anymore. <laughs> and I have three coming out um, soon. In fact, if you go um, to sendfox.com slash Fabian Space and sign up for my newsletter before December 1st, you get two free books. One is my, um, my sampler, which will give you a story from each of my universes, helps you decide where you want to start. Mm -hmm. And the other one is the Christmas story with my dragon, Vern, and Sister Grace. And it's their first Christmas together. Exciting. Well, 
thanks again, everybody, for joining us today at the, uh, if you're watching this at the con, I hope you enjoy the con. Uh, come also and check us out at legendfiction.com. It's the creative community for modern Catholic and Orthodox authors, a private community to share your works in progress, give and get feedback, and make friends. So until next time, keep writing. We hope you enjoy Legend Haven. God bless you.